Hello and welcome back to the channel. My name is Dr. James Gill and you join me for another video. Today we're going to be looking at the uh, anatomy, specifically the bones of um, the shoulder here. So from my perspective, the shoulder is a very elegant joint. I mean, in many ways, more so from a movement perspective in that, you know, it's one of the most complex joints in the body and that allows us to have the biggest range of movement of you know, any of the other body's joints. You know, think about your hip, your knees, your hands, etc. Now, visually, I think the symmetry of the knee is perhaps more pleasing, certainly to my eye anyway. But anybody who's had a problem with their shoulder will tell you that the shoulder is significantly more important to day-to-day -day life. I mean, losing the ability to fully move your shoulder is going to have a colossal impact on a patient's day-to-day -day activities. Everything from the, you know, the minor scratching of the back to relieve an itch to difficulties getting dressed in the morning or, heck, even washing your hair. I mean, these are activities which can't easily be adapted for, no matter what my granddad would have told you about his love for his back scratcher. Now, in terms of talking about the shoulder, we're going to start off with the bones. And that's relatively simple. We've only got three that we need to remember. We've got the clavicle or um, collarbone, we've got the scapula on the back, this big wing of bone, and we've got the humerus on the side, which is going to do the vast majority of uh, the work in terms of um, when you're moving your shoulder. And that in itself should bring us nicely to uh, the joints of the shoulder. Um, we've got our three bones forming three joints. We've got the sternocavicular joint, where we're interfacing between the sternum and the clavicle. We've got the uh, acromioclavicular joint where um, the acromion of the scapula is interfacing with the clavicle. And we've got the glenohumeral joint. There's also the scapula thoracic joint on the back of the, um, uh, uh, the back of the shoulder where we articulate against the thorax. Now don't worry, I haven't lost the ability to count. As with everything in medicine, there's an exception. So whilst we have said we have three joints, but I've counted four things, our glenohumeral joint, our acromioclavicular joint, and our sternocavicular joint are the true joints of um, the shoulder. The scapular thoracic joint is an area of articulation rather than a true joint. And we can double down with that because it's not even a synovial joint, hence it really is a false joint. Now, don't get me wrong, this is important, and there's a big independency between the acromioclavicular joint, the sternocavicular joint, and the scapular thoracic joint or area of articulation, as movement at any two of these three joints will also affect the third. But we'll talk about that a little bit more later. So the biggest joint of the shoulder is the glenohumeral joint, which is also the most mobile joint in the body overall. Now, the glenohumeral joint, it's a ball and socket joint, and that's formed with the humerus and the scapula interfacing. And they will allow the core articulations of uh, the shoulder, that being flexion, extension, abduction, adduction, and external and internal rotation. Basically, you need good range of movement at your glenohumeral joint to do anything of note with your shoulder. Now, this range of movement is only possible because the glenohumeral joint is a synovial joint like that of the hip and the knee. Therefore, we're seeing the joint is lined with hyaline or articular cartilage. The joint is also filled with synovial fluid or held in place by a synovial capsule. So you can't get much more of a synovial joint than you're looking at with the glenohumeral joint. However, unlike our two other massive synovial joints in the body, that being the knee and the hip, the shoulder isn't a weight-bearing joint. Well, not unless you're doing a lot of press-ups anyway. Um, but as such, this articular cartilage doesn't require the same degree of thickness as we see in the hip or the knee. I mean, we've seen the massive thick plates of uh, cartilage 
and there is nothing like that present in uh, the shoulder because we've not got that weight-bearing shock absorption that's required. Now, it sounds trite to say that the shoulder joint isn't a weight-bearing joint, but from an anatomical perspective, it's now very, very poorly designed in order to be able to bear significant weight. So not only is it lined with a thinner articular cartilage, as we've just highlighted, but the glenohumeral head is in a much shallower fossa compared to the um, fossa on the acetabulum, where the hip um, is going to uh, articulate with the pelvis. Now this very shallow uh, glenoid fossa um, gives us this huge range of movement, but unlike the deep robust socket we see in the hip, the glenohumeral head is only in partial contact with the glenohumeral fossa. And this trade-off for extra mobility means that the stability of the glenohumeral joint is reduced and hence we see the frequency of injuries at that glenohumeral joint, whether we're talking about a dislocation where the whole joint has come apart, whether we're meaning fractures, subluxations or impingement. The glenohumeral joint is a bit of a troublemaker clinically. So let's just try and you know, talk a little bit more about some of those bones. The scapula is a little bit of a, an odd creature sitting there on the back of the thorax, essentially forming the rear of the shoulder girdle. And perhaps this location means that from an accident, from an A&E perspective, we're going to pay a little bit more attention to the scapula if it's become injured because it's normally so protected. Now, that seems a strange thing to say, particularly because we know that fractures to the scapula are quite rare. And that's because well, it needs a huge amount of force to break or fracture or damage the scapula. And I'm not just meaning that the scapula takes a lot of force to break compared to the clavicle. I mean, some days I think that the clavicle, if you look at it um, in the wrong way, will break. But I mean, there's a, a hugely strong um, structure um, to the scapula. So any, anything that's been able to break this bone means that the person, the patient, has received a huge amount of force or trauma to their body. So this is very important because knowing that the patient will have received a large amount of energy in their accident because we can see they've fractured their scapula, we, call, we then term this a, a, a distraction injury because, yeah, sure, your scapula's fractured, but it's, it's not the end of the world. It certainly shouldn't be a life-threatening injury. Thus, what we need to do is look again at the patient and find out where else they're injured, as it's quite likely if they've sustained enough force to break their scapula, then there are going to be other significant uh, injuries elsewhere in the body that we may not have picked up yet. Now, in terms of the scapula, there are several protuberances coming off it, which are clinically relevant. And the first off is the acromion from the wing of the scapula, and it arises anteriorly forming the, the roof or the top of the shoulder. Now clinically the acromion is very important as it acts both as the insertion and the origin for uh, the midport of the, uh, the deltoid and various ligaments there. And essentially it's going to mean that you can leave your arm up in adduction because those muscles are going to be pulling against the acromion giving us that lever uh, motion. Now on the top of the scapula, we've got this wonderfully deep supraspinatus fossa um, in which, unsurprisingly, the supraspinatus muscle is uh, going to originate and run. Now supraspinatus will then run along under the acromion before going into the greater tubercle, this large bulge on the top of the humerus. And all of that again is about focusing the streamlining the movements of the shoulder. Now, given today we're, we're largely dealing with the bones of the shoulder, we'll, we'll try and discuss the, uh, the muscles in another video. Otherwise, honestly, this thing would be well over an hour in length, and I don't think that that works for anybody. So we'll, we'll come to those uh, later. Now, whilst we're talking about uh, the scapula as a bone in its own right, we've sort of touched a little bit about the interface between the humerus and uh, the fossa, on the scapula, it would probably be an appropriate time to talk about shoulder dislocations.
So essentially, a, 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 a shoulder dislocation is relatively straightforward. It's when we've got failure of the ligaments of the shoulder to prevent excess movement at the glenohumeral joint, and we end up with the, uh, the head of the humerus coming out of that glenoid fossa, resulting in our dislocation. Now, the commonest cause of a shoulder dislocation is an anterior dislocation, so it's your humerus is coming forwards out of the fossa. So an anterior dislocation of the shoulder tends to occur when the arm is adducted to 90 degrees and is also externally rotated. You shove a bit of force from the back there and the physics of the glenohumeral joint is going to result in plenty of damage as you stretch and possibly tear these ligaments. So just put your arm adducted and externally rotated and push back ever so slightly and you can feel the pressure along the front of uh, the shoulder girdle there. You can probably see how with not too much force in this abnormal position it will be possible for the, um, the, the, the glenoid fossa to dislocate and well we end up with that anterior dislocation. Now, just to be clear, a shoulder dislocation is nothing like you see uh, you know, in the movies. Somebody just shrugs and pops it back in. But, I mean, you can try and do that in real life, but excluding the searing pain you're going to experience and the probability of you actually being able to overcome the own, your own muscle strength, you're going to run a really high risk of causing damage when you try and relocate it yourself. So frankly, when you see people relocating their shoulder in movies and TV, it almost should carry a health warning, don't try this at home. I mean, I'm not suggesting it should do it. It looks cool when you see that, but it's medically daft. Now I'm sure that, the, now with, when I say medically daft, I'm sure there's someone going to say they've got a friend who's dislocated their shoulder many times and has had no issues. They've been told about risks to the auxiliary nerve, but they've never had any issues. So it's fine, isn't it? I'll tell you what, let's put some numbers to it, shall we? To start off, what's the chance of you damaging this axillary nerve? Well, it's not actually the dislocation that causes the problem with our axillary nerve. It's the relocation because everything has been stretched and distorted inside the shoulder capsule. And that nerve can end up caught when the, uh, the, uh, the shoulder is relocated. So with each anterior dislocation of the shoulder, when we relocate it, there's between a 9 and 65% probability that um, you know, you're going to damage that nerve putting it back in. And clinically, when you're working in the A&E department, hence it's vitally important that you do the neurovascular status on the patient's arm before you attempt to relocate it. Because if they've already got damage to that axillary nerve, but you haven't documented it, well, you're going to be held accountable for that even if you haven't done it. So make sure your documentation there is flawless. Now, I mean, we go on about the risk to the axillary nerve, and that's going to risk the overall function of the arm. But what do I mean when I say that? Well, when the axillary nerve is damaged, you're going to lose, it, lose innovation to your deltoid muscles. So you're going to be robbed of that 15 to 90 degrees range of abduction. You're, going to, you're also going to impair the ability of delta to help you flex and extend the arm. So it doesn't sound like something you want to be encountering, does it? Oh, oh, your friend still thinks that it's a cool party trick to be able to dislocate and relocate her shoulder. Fine. You'll also find that the axillary nerve will supply one of the other muscles, teres minor, one of the small muscles on the back of the shoulder. If you get, lose that, you're going to find externally rotating the shoulder that much more difficult as well. And fine, let's give you that final parting gift. If the axillary nerve is damaged, we're going to lose sensation over something called the regimental patch on the outside of the arm. And honestly, that's more of a warning sign than anything else, because I don't know about you, but I don't use the outside of my shoulder to, well, sense things. So if you have missed the subtle hint there, Please don't try and relocate yours or a friend's um, dislocated shoulder on your own. Please go down to the A&E department so we can get you the proper care and hopefully prevent damage to that nerve.
Now, staying with the Hollywood uh, bit for a second, there's always somebody on TV in a straitjacket dislocating their shoulder to try and get out of said straitjacket. Now, it's not just the auxiliary nerve that we're going to run the risk of damaging there. We're going to run the risk of stretching and potentially tearing those ligaments of the glenohumeral joint capsule that are there to keep the shoulder in place. So hopefully you can see what the corollary here is. Assuming you'll, by a miracle, manage to miss damaging your auxiliary nerve, you're going to stretch and damage these ligaments. So every time you dislocate and relocate the shoulder, those ligaments are going to become laxer. So to give you some numbers for that, after every dislocation and relocation, there's between a 14 and 100% chance that there will be another dislocation. And the greater the number of dislocations that occur, the greater the damage, the greater the likelihood of a further dislocation. Oh, and did I mention that with every dislocation, you've got between a one in two and a two in three chance of damaging the axillary nerve? Seriously, don't dislocate your uh, shoulder. And if you do, get a professional to help you put it back in. I mean, if you're getting recurrent dislocations, we're even going to consider surgery to try and tighten up that joint capsule, because this is major leak damage you could uh, run the risk of sustaining. Now, just to really wrap up how important these uh, dislocations are, there is something called the unhappy triad, where you're going to get dislocation of the shoulder and a rotator cuff tear and an auxiliary nerve injury. But I think I've stress the point sufficiently at the moment that dislocations aren't a good thing and maybe we'll look at the unhappy triad in a little bit more detail in the muscle video. Now we've talked about you know damage to the ligaments um, but we really need to underline how important the ligaments are generally in the shoulder as anchors. They're literally holding the shoulder together and that, that's demonstrated really quite beautifully with the acromioclavicular joint. We've got two ligaments there, the coracoacromial ligament and the coracoclavicular ligament. And to be honest, without the acromioclavicular joint and its two ligaments, well, frankly, your shoulder's just going to be a little bit useless. Why? Because these ligaments are going to be important not so much for the stabilising of the shoulder, but allowing the transmission of forces through the shoulder. So you can do, you know, the world's strongest man, um, you know, feats and things like that. By having these intact ligaments means that you can use your arms to move huge amounts of weight because these ligaments are going to hold the bones together and mean that we're not just relying on the strength of our muscles, but the strength of our muscles can pull against the attachments from our bones. If there's one thing the body is good at, it's specialising and, and adapting. And there's one ligament in the shoulder where we see that really clearly. The glenoid labrum around the outside of the glenoid fossa is a very specialised piece of tissue. Now this labrum has an exceptionally important role with regard to the glenohumeral joint. By deepening the fossa, it means that we've got an increased range of movement at the shoulder before we get dislocations. So it's really, really vital to um, well, our overall movement of the shoulder, which is why labral tears can A, be so painful and B, cause significant problems down the line. So given that the uh, glenoid labrum is there to allow increased range of movement, Similarly, that um, ligament is going to be injured with things that would put us in an abducted, externally rotated position. So anything you know, where we're looking at overhead movements or bowling, for example, so cricket bowling, baseball pitches or repeated over the head movements, that's going to put stress on this ligament, potentially meaning tears, laxities and then issues with dislocations. Now, we can have it the other way around. A dislocation can result in a tear in the labrum, which will then give us those further recurrent dislocations, as we've mentioned earlier. So we can see that the, the complexity of the shoulder allows these wonderful movements, but at the same time, the complexity is its own weakness for the shoulder in terms of damage. Now, for me, the glenoid labrum is a very interesting tissue. We're no longer um, so concerned about its tensional strength as we are with other ligaments but now looking at its ability to resist compression. 
And again, like the patella ligament in the knee slash patella tendon, where we've got this blending of tissues, we've definitely got that going on um, with the glenoid labrum as it's formed partially of the tissue of the short head of bicep tendon. And we need to keep in mind that tendons and ligaments are both functionally different, the ligaments holding bone to bone, whereas the tendons are doing muscle to bone, but structurally they also look very different if we look at them under a microscope. So you know, the fact that we've got this change in um, function and change in structure for this very specialised bit of tissue is, for me, one of those wonders of medicine and anatomy. So we've talked about the glenohumeral joint, certainly. In order to discuss the two other joints of the shoulder, that being the sternocavicular joint and the acromioclavicular joint, we need to discuss the collarbone or the clavicle, which, as mentioned, is frankly a pain in the neck. My only contact with um, the clavicle has been essentially when somebody's fallen and fractured this S-shaped piece of bone. Now that's not me bemoaning trauma work in the A&E. It, it's a fact. The clavicle is the most fractured bone in the body. About 5% of all fractures are on this bone. So given this and its apparent fragility, what do we need to know about the clavicle or the collarbone? Well, when we talk about the clavicle, we refer to the end attached to uh, the sternum on the chest as the sternal end, and the end involved with the formation of the shoulder, where it's attached to the acromion, as the acromial end. I mean, anatomy sometimes is as simple as it seems. And at both ends, we're going to find the corresponding acromioclavicular joint or the sternocavicular joint. Sternally, the clavicle attaches to the chest at the manubrium of the sternum. Here we've got this sternocavicular joint, a synovial lined saddle joint, but lined with fibrocartilage rather than hyaline cartilage. Remember, this is a structural joint. We want to have a small amount of movement to it rather than um, you know, one of the pure hyaline um, lined articular joints such as the glenohumeral joint. Because the movement of the sternocavicular joint is much less than other synovial joints, we've got a fibrocartilage lining as opposed to a hyaline cartilage lining. That will improve the strength of the joint overall. The role of the sternocavicular joint is essentially to coordinate movements of the upper limb with the body. And it's very interesting that although it's a saddle joint, functionally it behaves as a ball and socket joint, giving movements of elevation, depression, protraction and retraction, as well as axial rotation. But these movements, again, we've not got a, a, a high line lining here. These movements are made possible because we've got this fibre cartilaginous disc, which will separate the cavicula from the sternal surfaces. And this is particularly key to allowing this axial rotation. Did I mention that the shoulder is the most complex joint in the body? It certainly is. At the opposite end, at the acromial end of the clavicle, is the acromioclavicular joint, a plain type synovial joint, again fibrocartilage lined because we don't need that degrees of movement. And here we've got flat articular surfaces allowing articulation between the acromia of the scapula and the clavicle. So whereas the main role of the um, sternocavicular joint is to guide the movements of the shoulder, with the acromiocavicular joint, here it's to actually allow increased range of movement of the scapula thoracic joint. If we were fixed at the acromiocavicular joint, then the, the, uh, the scapula wouldn't be able to move as far as it does. And, and that movement of the scapula thoracic joint facilitated by the acromioclavicular joint means that we get increased flexion forearm and increased abduction because the movement uh, is made possible here with this um, acromioclavicular joint. Now it's important that we raise this now whilst we're discussing the clavicle because the ligaments really do hold the shoulder together. Sure, we've got the deltoid muscles, we've got the uh, supraspinatus muscles, we've got the rotator cuff, we've got the biceps, all of which do help to connect the shoulder to the acromion and the scapula uh, 
and the clavicle, but very few of those muscles are actually going to help anchor the shoulder. The sternocavicular joint and the clavicle literally hold the shoulder, hold the arm to the body. That's how important these ligaments are, that they're the main thing that sort of keeps us well, whole, for want of a better phrase. The sternocavicular and acromocavicular joints provide the link between the arm and the body. Unlike the hip, where you've got this deep ball and socket joint, the femur and pelvis, they're going to be holding the hip to the body. The glenohumeral joint isn't deep enough with that. Even with the glenoid labrum, it doesn't have that strength there. So the strength of the sternocavicular joints and its ligaments, they're going to be the things physically holding the arm onto the torso. And this linkage of arm to body conveys two further functions to the clavicle. It acts to transmit forces from the upper arm to the rest of the skeleton, but also maintains the stability and the motion of the shoulder. Think about it, if we put too much force on it, then this clavicle is going to prevent us coming too far forwards, and hopefully those ligaments prevent us coming too far backwards. But there's always a trade-off, so this linkage is one of the reasons why clavicles fraction so often. So a really good example of that is called a foosh, or a fall on the outstretched hand. Here, the force is transmitted up the extended arm through the clavicle, which tends either to displace the acromocavicular joint, because whilst these ligaments are really tough, there's only so much force they can restrain, or that force continues to propagate through and then fracturing in the distal third of the clavicle. Hence why A, falls are so common, B, falls on outstretched hands are so common, and C, hence why we get the clavicle being the most fractured bone of any in the body. Now, whilst we've only been talking about the bones of the shoulder, I think we've covered quite a lot of ground, and we can see how the interplay between the clavicle, the humerus, and the scapula is so important for the function uh, of the shoulder overall. I mean, we've highlighted that the sternocavicular and the acromiocavicular joints are so important to uh, the shoulder because they well, essentially hold everything together. But we've got an interplay between all three joints and our fourth area of articulation. Um, this interplay allows us to have this huge range of movement and allows us to well, do all the wonderful things that this massively you know, articulate uh, forelimb enables us. But when we're talking about bones, the, the clavicle and the scapula, you know, as bones, they are facilitators for um, the movement of the glenohumeral joint. And even at that glenohumeral joint, it's the humerus that is doing the lion's share of the work in the shoulder. And I don't even mean that in terms of straightforward movements of the shoulder, because everything is going to um, have an interplay in allowing this huge range of movement. But when I say the lion's share of the work, just think about the forces that the humerus has to tolerate. The femur mainly gets loading from walking and running, but lifting something forwards, that's going to have these lifting forces levered through the humerus. And yet the cortical bone, the cross cancellus bone and the medullary cavity, all of these are able to bear and support these forces through the humerus without us fracturing. So again, it, it's a marvel the shoulder is as specialised and as adapted as it is. So before we go, at the start we listed the three joints of the shoulder and yet highlighted the scapular thoracic joint which doesn't get included in the joint count itself, because, as said, it's not a true anatomical joint, merely this air of articulation against the thoracic cage. Basically, the function of the scapular thoracic joint is to streamline the movements across the chest wall, which is highlighted in the movements that it facilitates. So the scapular thoracic joint allows us to protract and retract the shoulder essentially punching movements. It allows us to turn the arm in and out for our internal and external rotation. And finally, it allows us to raise and depress our shoulders. Can we see the interplay between the acromiocavicular joint, the sternocavicular, and slightly the glenohumeral joint? 
In order to use our shoulders normally, in order to get the maximum range of movement, we need you know, all of our joints in the shoulder to be healthy. And hence why, as I said with the scapular thoracic joint, mo any movement in the three joints there will lead to a movement in the other. We flip it round. If there are problems at either of these two joints, it will affect the movement at the others. Now this brings us right back to the start of the video where we highlighted that um, uh, the shoulder has the greatest range of movement of any joint in the body. This range of movement is only possible due to the interplay and the synchronization of the joints that make up the shoulder overall. I think that in itself is probably an effective time to wrap up uh, this video. So we've talked about uh, the three bones of the shoulder, the clavicle, the humerus and the scapula. We've talked about the three joints in the shoulder and that additional area of articulation. And we've touched on the ligaments which help hold everything together. I hope this has been useful. Um, and if you want to know more about the shoulder, drop, drop in the comments below and we'll look at doing a video on the muscles of the shoulder. So with that in mind, you know, if you'd like to see more of these, please like the video because that tells YouTube we're here. And if you'd like updates, please click on the subscribe button and then you can, um, uh, you'll get notifications for when the next video is up and potentially join us in the comments section where we've got quite a burgeoning little community growing. Well, take care and we'll see you in the next one. Cheerio.